Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Y- y'all have handouts, and actually, you have a two-page handout, but really, we're not going to cover the whole two pages of information. Um, I thought that I might try to put Satan and demons into one lesson, but they're just too much about Satan to get into one lesson. So, uh, and demons to get into one lesson. So, I'll have to separate them. So, you'll b- bring back your handouts next time to do the demons part. But of course, the, you know, Satan and the demons kind of go hand in hand. And remember when we began the first, the fir- very first class we had, and then, I know you were here. I don't know if the rest of y'all were here, but we talked about some basic ground rules. And one of the ground rules uh, is that we're going to use a, a normal hermeneutic in interpreting Scripture. What that means is we're going to read it and, and try to make the plain language speak for itself as opposed to uh, reading 21st century Western modern mindset back into it. <clears throat> I think I've shared this before, but uh, there's a famous Bible called the Jefferson Bible, if you've ever heard of it, where Thomas Jefferson went through the New Testament, really the Gospels, I guess, and he cut out all those parts of the Gospels that were supernatural because he didn't believe in, in the supernatural. And so he was he, he was not using a literal hermeneutic. He, he was he was saying, this, this just couldn't have happened. You can't walk on water. Click, 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 and t- and t- he took it out. And I think sometimes we tend to do that with Scripture. We, we tend to struggle with the supernatural parts of it that don't fit our Western modern mindset. And um, it's it's not, you know, it's not a sin. It just is not the right way to read the Bible, if that makes sense. Just pass that over. Um, so we're going to use a, a normal hermeneutic, and we're going to study Satan today, which is an interesting uh, topic in and of itself. Um, and, you know, in our day and age... I would think that a lot of people do not believe that Satan even exists. Or if they believe in a Satan, they don't think of uh, a being as being Satan. They think of he's the personification of evil, for example. He isn't really a person. He's just a, a an amalgamation of all the things that are wrong with the world. But the Bible teaches the reality of Satan. He's, he's really is a, a – I don't want to say person because it makes it sound like Satan's like us and he's not – I use the word being or creature. He's, he's really a created being is the way the Bible kind of unfolds it. And so um, and the evidence of, his, of, of the reality of Satan comes in a lot of different places. Um, for example, seven books in the Old Testament teach about uh, Satan. Genesis, First Chronicles, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. Um, and every writer in the New Testament affirms the reality of Satan. Jesus himself affirms the reality of Satan. He's not just an idea. He's really a being. There are 29 passages in the, in the four Gospels that refer directly to, to Satan. And in 25 of those 29 passages, Jesus is doing the talking. <laughs> so if Satan's not real, then Jesus is either misleading us or he's crazy. Yeah, demented himself. Um, and, 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 and the way Jesus talks about Satan, too, I mean, it, it, there certainly is... The, um, you know the reality of him. Um, for example, in Luke 11:18, um, Jesus says, "If Satan's divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand?" I mean, it's clearly a reference to a, bur- a, a being or a person or a creature. So um, you have the evidence from the text that speaks to the reality of Satan. You also have ev- evidence of his personality um, because he has uh, traits of personality. For example, uh, in 2 Corinthians 11:3. It says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. So Satan was crafty. He was smart. He was wise. He was manipulative. All things that are attributes of a person. Um, he exhibits emotions. In, in Revelation 12:17, it says the dragon was enraged, angry. Um, he, in Luke 22:31, 31, um, Jesus tells Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. So Satan has desires, he, things he wants to see happen. Um, he has a will. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2.26, um, uh, there's a reference by Paul. It says, that, uh, praying, to, to, praying about two people, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So he has a will. Satan, like, like we do, we, have, we, we want something to happen. We have desires and wills. Um, there are pronouns of personality. Um, He's refer- Satan's referred to as a, as a person in both the Old and New Testaments. 
in the Old Testament, if you remember famously Job chapter 1, where, where uh, God invites Satan to observe my servant Job. And there's the whole discussion there is God and Satan talking, and he, obviously Satan is portrayed as a person. And you have also in famously in the temptation of Christ in Matthew chapter 4, um, uh, Jesus and Satan interact like you and I would interact. We talk. They talk like we talk. And uh, Jesus even refers to Satan using um, personal pronouns. Masculine pronouns, him, him, he, he. So uh, you have that as well. And finally, um, a third argument for the personality of Satan is uh, the fact that in Matthew 25:41, uh, Jesus says, uh, in talking about the sheep and the goats, uh, he, that he will say to those on his left, "Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels." So there's a, there's a judgment and a, and a punishment coming for the devil and his angels. And you wouldn't hold an idea morally responsible. You'd only hold a person morally responsible. You can't punish an idea, right? So um, certainly the Bible teaches that that Satan is real. Um, His nature, um, he's a creature. Um, And we're going to look into this. By that I mean he's created. Um, There are two passages in the Old Testament from which we get a lot of information about Satan. One is Ezekiel 28 and the other is uh, Isaiah 14. And the, the, we're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail when we get there. But for purposes of our discussion, let's assume that Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19 actually refers to Satan. Um, and in that passage, uh, in verse 15, um, God says, You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. That might be, maybe Dwayne can't get in, maybe. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, the, the word angel just means messenger, and it can be a positive thing or a negative thing. Yes, absolutely. Here you go, Dwayne. Sorry, I'm late. No, it's okay. It's all good. We're, we're talking about Satan. About yeah. we're talking about the fact he's a created being. In Ezekiel 28:15, God just says, "You are blameless in your ways from the day you were created, until unrighteousness was found in you." I mean, so he's a creature. He's created. Um, but he's also a spirit being. Um, in Ezekiel 28, verse 14, he's, he's called a cherub, or it's one of the cherubim. It says, you were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. So uh, Satan is an angelic creature. Um, <clears throat> you also have uh, other places, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but he's referred to as the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Paul says, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Also, in Ephesians 2.2, 2, um, he refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. So, he's a creature, but he's also a spirit being. And Satan has a lot of names uh, in Scripture. Um, the, the first and most obvious name is, of course, Satan, right? <laughs> Um, and that's the, from the Hebrew word uh, Satan, which means adversary or opposer. And you see Satan, it's used 52 times in the Bible. Zechariah 3.1 in the Old Testament, for example, when he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Uh, Matthew 4.10. And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it's written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Um, then Revelation multiple times you see him referred to as Satan. Um, uh, he's called the devil 35 times from the Greek word diabolos, um, which means slanderer. For example, in Ma- Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, uh, where Matthew says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And, of course, we, he's referred to by Jesus as Satan later on, so obviously they're interchangeable, right? They're not two different people there. Um, <clears throat> uh, John refers to him as – actually, in – uh, Jesus refers to John as the, in John 17:15 as the evil one, the one who wants to do harm. 
Um, it's also referred to in 1 John 5, 18 and 19 as the evil one, where he says, We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So um, he's referred to as the evil one. Um, he's referred to as the serpent, famously, right? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, And indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And so there he's the serpent. And also you see uh, in 2 Corinthians eleven three, Paul refers to him and that event uh, uh, as a serpent, I'm afraid, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And then, of course, multiple times in the book of Revelation, you see him referred to as a serpent. In Revelation 12:9, um, that one verse pulls together uh, four of his names or five of his names all in one verse, and it says, "And the great dragon was thrown down." The serpent of old, who's called the devil, there's three names right there. Satan, there's four, who deceives the whole world. He's also the deceiver. So <clears throat> it's Revelation 12:9. Um, as we just read, he's, he's called the, the great red dragon uh, in uh, Revelation 12:3, 12:7, and 12:9. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, he's also referred to as the accuser um, in Revelation 12:10. Uh, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And there's a really beautiful picture uh, and we look, we, in Zechariah chapter 3 um, where, uh, where Joshua the high priest, this is kind of personified, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And so we have this, this picture of Satan accusing um, Joshua and us, I guess, as well, of something, our sin, right? And, of course, the accusation is not without merit, right? <laughs> we, we're, we're as guilty as we can be. And, of course, then you have Jesus on the other side saying, nope, I, yeah, he did it, but I, I paid that penalty. That's, that, that debt's been erased. So um, that's one of ch Satan's chief functions is to be the accuser. And you think about there's actually a practicality to this because if you just focus on being accused and don't understand the grace and the forgiveness that, that you receive from Jesus, that's quite a burden, isn't it? Yeah. Accused, accused, accused. You did it, you did it, you did it, you did it. <laughs> and, of course, again, most of the time we did it. <laughs> so – so without a, a, a remedy for the we did it, then life is, you know, not so good, I would say. So anyway, but that's what he, he's the he's the accuser. He does it over and over again. And that's why it's so important in first John, chapter two, verses one, one and two. John says, my little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with fought with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. So it's a great reminder by John that, that yeah, we, we shouldn't sin, but if we do, we have an advocate on our behalf who stands at God's right hand to intercede for us and, and, and make sure that God knows that we uh, belong to Jesus. Um, of course, God knows that anyway, but it's, maybe it's more for our, for our purposes than anybody else's just to know that Jesus is there to make sure that um, that, that God knows that we're his. So anyway, he's also referred to as the tempter. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, it says, And the tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. You see it also in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. For this reason, when I can endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you. So, and of course, uh, we're going to look a little bit more about, about about Satan's activities being the tempter, but I think we can all probably relate to that part of life, right, being tempted. Um, uh, <clears throat> he also he, he tempts uh, – in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Paul says, Stop depriving one another, talking about a husband and wife, sexual relationships, except by agreement for a time, since you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. A, a, he uses sexual sin and sexual temptation to, to tempt believers to immorality. 
Um, he also attempted, or attempted, excuse me, he, attempt, he tempted uh, Ananias and, and Sapphira, right, in Acts chapter 5, uh, to uh, lie about the money that they gave for the land that they sold. They only said they gave all the money to the church, but they did, and they kept some back. They weren't in trouble for keeping some back. They were in trouble for lying about it. They were tempted to, 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 to not tell the truth. So they, they said they gave it all, but they didn't because they wanted to look like they were better than they were. And, of course, bad things happened there as well. Um, and uh, finally, um, Satan is given several titles in the New Testament. In John chapter 12, verse 31, he's referred to as the ruler of this world, where it says, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Um, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he's referred to as the, as the God of this world. It says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. <laughs> in Ephesians 2, 2, he's referred to as the prince of the power of the air, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, um, and the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Um, as the deceiver, he deceives the whole world in Revelation uh, twelve nine. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. That's what he does. He's the deceiver of the world. Um, where does he live? Apparently in the heavenly places, because it says in Ephesians six twelve. Uh, Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And certainly Satan would be one of those spiritual forces of wickedness. Um, and the, the importance, he's also referred to as Beelzebul, which means chief of demons in Luke 11:15, where where the uh, Pharisees accused Jesus of being, being um, a demon-possessed himself, which is kind of the worst kind of blasphemy. And then also Paul refers to him as Belial, B-E-L-I-A-L, in 2 Corinthians 6.15. And here's what's important about, about the names of Satan. Um, just like today, names in the Old Testament, New Testament, say something about you. My father's name was Whitey. Really, my mom was referred to often as the redhead. Um, somebody's called Lefty. I mean... In in watching Star Trek, you have Scotty, right? I mean, and, and other other you know uh, Ed Two Tall Jones. I mean, the, the, these the, the words that become part of our name often describe something about us. And so you think about that when, with respect to Satan, tempter, deceiver. He's a dragon. Sometimes that means he's vicious and, and harmful. Uh, he's he's the evil one. He wants bad things to happen to you. So all of his names, in some way or another, describe some aspect of either his behavior or his person. So it's good to know. His names, um, and we're going to see in a little bit what, why it's important. Because keep in mind, he's referred to as the ruler of this world by Jesus several times, the prince of the power of the air, right? Um, and and so, what does it mean that he's the ruler of this world? He's got a kingdom. He's got a kingdom, and we live in his kingdom, whether we realize it or not. And I don't think I don't think people who live in America think of it that way. But when when uh, Satan tempted Jesus by saying, if you'll bow down and worship me in Matthew 4, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Remember that? Jesus said, no, you know, we should worship only the Lord your God. Well, what kingdoms of the world was Satan offering Jesus? All of the kingdoms of the world. All means all. So that means Great Britain and America and Canada. I mean, countries we don't think of as being dark in a way we think of actually being a good influence in the world and of course we are in many ways but still nonetheless th our kingdom belongs to him whether we realize it or not so anyway so let's look at the creation of of, uh, of satan and his sin um <clears throat> we aren't told precisely when satan was created but in john chapter 1 verse 3 john says all things came into being through him meaning jesus and apart from him, nothing came into being that's come into being. So he says it both ways. He created everything, and nothing is here that didn't come from him. So uh, being one of the created beings, Jesus created him at some point in time. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 says something similar. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Remember, thrones, dominions, rulers and authorities are, are references to angelic beings. Um, all things have been created through him. Uh, so uh, he was created at some point in the past. And we know that uh, 
he was in Eden, right? In chapter, because he, he tempted Eve in, in the Garden of Eden. And in, in Genesis 2 8, that's when the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. So, sometime prior to the, to, to the creation of the Garden of Eden, he was created. He's not an eternal being, um, he's a creature. Don't know when, but sometime in, in the distant, distant past. Um, uh, in terms of, of the characteristics of his. Uh, uh, creation. Um, this is where we're going to come to Ezekiel 28, and if you, you might even turn there, if you if you will, um, because we're going to spend a little time talking about it. And the same thing is going to be true of of Isaiah 14, but in the first ten verses of Ezekiel 28, there's a reference to the ruler of Tyre, T Y R E. Um, it says, the word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, say to the leader of Tyre. And, of course, the leader of Tyre, just, the leader just means ruler. And Tyre is, was a kingdom that was northwest of Israel on the Mediterranean Sea. And the, the king of Tyre was very much a, uh, an opponent of Israel uh, militarily and otherwise. And he uh, uh, is judged here in the first ten verses of Ezekiel 28. And it's clearly a reference to him, the, the king of Tyre, or not the king, the ruler of Tyre. When you get when you get though to verse 11, if you're if you're following me here, um, the reference changes a little bit. It says again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord your God. And then he goes on to describe the king of Tyre, and you can see from the description that what he's describing isn't a king in the normal sense that we would understand it. For example, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Uh oh, this king of Tyre that's referred to was in Eden. Um, every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Obviously, the king of Tyre is not an angelic being. So the references here are really more to something other than just the king of Tyre. And I think most evangelical scholars believe he's describing Satan here. He's referring – there's actually a ruler of Tyre. And what verses 11 through 19 do is describe the power or the force that's behind or maybe even you know, possessing the king of Tyre. And it's a description of Satan is what it is. Um, this is where we get a lot of our information about Satan. Um, like I said, you were, you, were per, you were in Eden, the garden of the God. You were perfect. Uh, you were the anointed cherub who covers. That's verse 14. Um, verse 15, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Um, uh, by the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. These are all references to somebody who lived on the mountain of God. He was present in Eden. He was a cherub, and he was cast down. Uh, cast down to the ground. Exactly, to the ground. So um, I think this is a reference to, to, um, to Satan himself. I think most people would agree with that. Most, most, most evangelical scholars would take that position. Um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. First ten verses refer to a real king. And then beginning in verse 11, it shifts to describing the power behind the king. And, and it's not an unusual, I think, in Scripture, though, to, to have these kinds of, of near and far uh, uh, fulfillment of prophecy. Famously for the Christmas season, you know, in, in uh, Isaiah 7:14, there's a reference to, you know, behold, there's a virgin who will give birth. And as we know, the reference has, has it's a dual reference. It's a reference to uh, somebody who's in existence at the time that that's spoken. I guess it's King Ahaz, right? And and what he says is, before a woman can have a baby and grow up, I'll, I'll rescue Israel. But also, we know from the New Testament that it's also a far-term reference to Jesus Himself. A virgin will give birth, because it's, it's quoted in the, in the birth narratives in Matthew and Luke. So, so what uh, what do we learn about Satan from from um, from Ezekiel 28, um, quite, a bit. <laughs> quite a bit, yeah. He he was perfect. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was in Eden, the Garden of God. So he was there to to cause Eve to sin. Um, he's described in, a, in a, just an amazing way you know, as a precious stone. Was his covering, his workmanship and settings were perfect. Um, 
He was the anointed cherub who covers, and the, the, the cherubs are the ones who are responsible for God's holiness. Um, it says, yeah, I placed you there on the holy mountain of God. You walk in the midst of the stones of fire. So he was present in, in the presence of God. And quite often we see that Satan is, is found in God's presence, strangely enough. Um, in Job chapter 1, for example, when, when Job is, is first observed by Satan, God and, and Satan are there talking. Um, he was, you're blameless in your ways, from, so he's perfect from the day he was created until unrighteousness was found in him. So he had unparalleled wisdom and beauty. He was the, the, at the apex of God's creation. He was, he was the top creature, I guess, if you will. Um, he had a, a great place to live on the mountain of God. Um, he had uh, a, an unparalleled function. He was responsible for, for God's holiness. So all those things describe Satan. So when he was created, he was the epitome of God's creation. He, 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 was, he was as good as it gets. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to see here um, that, that that's why he and Jesus are such a, an amazing contrast. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, the sin of, of uh, Satan, um, this is where sin comes from. This is how sin got into the world in, in uh, Ezekiel 28, 15. You're blameless in your ways. From the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. So sin comes from or into the world through through Satan. Um, uh, this is the only place where we actually are, are told how sin gets into the world. Um, it comes from Satan. Uh, and the nature of that sin um, is is described in several places. Uh, let me find it here. Oh, there I am. Okay. I'm juggling two books here. Sorry. Um, the, the, the nature of his sin, well, again, we're, we have a, a passing reference uh, to the nature of his sin in 1 Timothy 3.6, where um, Timothy's, or Paul's talking to Timothy about, about uh, um, elders and deacons, and says that they shouldn't be a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. So conceit, pride. Was was um, at least part of his sin. Um, in verse seventeen, there in Ezekiel, it says, "Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor." So he, narcissistic in a way, yeah, yeah. His his pride. Also, in in in, in the it, whoops, in Ezekiel twenty eight sixteen, um, by the the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence. That's kind of a what, the abundance of your trade, what do you mean by that? Basically, basically what it means is that the things that you did, the, the powers you had, you used to serve yourself. Is, is the idea of what he's talking about there. So uh, Satan used his position to traffic in his own self-promotion is, is, is what the idea is. The Isaiah passage in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 17, um, same thing there. There's a reference to the king of... Uh, uh, Babylon, and and then and then he shifts from talking about a real king in Isaiah 14 to a supernatural king. And again, I believe, and I think most people believe that verses 12 through 17 don't describe the real king of Babylon. They describe Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn! Uh, you've been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And then nevertheless, you'll be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble and shook the kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and threw its cities, overthrew its cities, and who did not allow his prisoners to go home? So... So what what is the 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 the, the pride here? Uh, he's referred he's referred to in verse twelve of Isaiah fourteen as star of the morning or star of the dawn. Star of the morning actually is what it is. Um, and does anybody know what the, the Latin equivalent is of star of the morning? Lucifer. Lucifer, exactly. That's where we get the name Lucifer. The, the word the word Lucifer is not found in the Bible. It's the Latin equivalent of of star of the morning. Um, somebody else is referred to as a star of the morning. Do you know who that is? A bright morning star. Jesus, in the Revelation twenty two sixteen. So you you can kind of see Satan's Satan's um, 
Sin is to make himself like God and place himself in direct opposition to Jesus. Um, I will ascend, I will raise, I will sit, I will ascend, I will make myself like. That's, that's what Satan is doing. He's trying to create a parallel universe, not a universe, a parallel kingdom that doesn't depend upon God, but he has complete control and rule over. And I'm not sure that I always think of Satan in those terms, but I think that's very, very, very true. Um, that, that's what he, that, that's what his object actually is. I think Ed, that's why he's so uh, subtle to deceive us, because he represents himself a lot like the Lord, mm-hmm. like Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, it's you hard know, to tell him apart until you know the real thing. Yeah, and in Second Corinthians, we're going to look at this in a second. But in Second Corinthians, um, Paul tells us that that he sometimes masquerades as an angel of light. And we're going to talk about what that might look like. Um, it, w- w- back in the uh, Isaiah passage when it says, you know, star of the morning, how you have fallen, you know, right? It's, and it says uh, uh, there in the verse 12, you've been cut down to the earth, right? That's what Jesus is describing in Luke 10, 18 when he says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So anyway, <clears throat> oops, let me keep on going here. So uh, the nature of his sin is to make himself um, an alternative to God, to be in opposition to Jesus. He wants to be like the Most High, if you will, to have that kind of power. Um, and, of course, you know, he, Satan is an awfully wise, intelligent person. But think about the effects of, of Satan's sin. Um, in Revelation 12:7, um, it says there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. So angels were affected by Satan's sin. And we know that what will happen to them, they'll be cast into the lake of fire with Satan. Uh, Satan's sin affects all people. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, um, Paul refers to 2.1 is you are dead in your trespasses and transgressions in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirits now working in the sons of disobedience. So... Satan's sin affects all people. We all walked uh, according to the prince of the power of the air at one point in our lives. And sometimes we maybe unwittingly do so now without realizing it, or maybe even realizing it sometimes we, we do it. Um, uh, it, it, it. His sin affects all nations. In Revelation 20, verse 3, there's a reference that when Satan is thrown into the abyss after the second coming of Christ... He, the abyss is shut and sealed over him, meaning Satan, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. So Satan's sin deceives the nations, the peoples, and always has. And we're going to talk about what that deception might look like here in a little bit. You know, all sin is serious, and all sin affects other people, pretty much. But sin in the highest places is more serious, and its ramifications are pretty considerable. So let's take a look at the activities of Satan. First, let's look at his activities in relationship to Christ. Um, And you can see the animosity between Jesus and Satan that was first predicted in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right? I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to the serpent here, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So from the very first moment that sin invaded God's perfect world, um, there was enmity, conflict between Jesus and Satan. And the activities that, that have resulted, Satan's activities that have resulted from, uh, uh, from that are, are pretty, pretty much widespread. It began, for example, as early as when Jesus was a baby. When Herod found out about the king of Israel being born in Bethlehem, what did he do? And Matthew 2, yeah, Matthew 2, 16, Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, became enraged, and went and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem from two years old and under. So undoubtedly behind Herod's act was Satan who was trying to kill the baby Jesus before Jesus could grow up and and do what he's supposed to do. Um, You have uh, um, also uh, in... Oops, let me see here. Um, In Famously in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23... Jesus was telling the disciples he's about to go up to Jerusalem and be crucified. So he says, from the time, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, 
this shall never happen to you. And But he turned, meaning Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. Um, you're a stumbling block to me. You're not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's interest. So, obviously, from the very start, Jesus' mission to earth was, was known to Satan. He was, he's come to redeem mankind from, from Satan's sin. And when Peter tries to divert Jesus from his purpose, uh, Jesus recognizes exactly where that attempted diversion came from. Satan had deceived Peter. And so Jesus speaks directly to Satan, get behind me. Uh, and so not, not, that, not that Peter wasn't Satan, but certainly Peter was influenced by that thought. And think about it, the thought itself, oh, saving a man from, from his death, that's a good thing, isn't it? But in the context of Jesus, obviously, that meant that none of us would be redeemed and saved. So you see uh, Satan's activity trying to keep Jesus from the cross. When Judas was about to betray Jesus on, in John 13, 27, after the morsel, Satan then entered Judas, right? So you have also Satan then becoming a means of Jesus' arrest and ultimately his crucifixion, right? Because Satan went out and, just, and betrayed Jesus. But the principle and the most direct attack of Satan on Jesus is found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, where you see the temptation of Christ. And there's something about this that we need to really think about. Um, and if you go there to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, there's this peculiar thing that's, that's actually stated. And sometimes we, we pass over it and don't give it the consideration that it deserves. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And it almost sounds like that's not something that God should be doing, leading us into temptation, right? In fact, that's kind of the opposite of what's prayed in the, in the Lord's Prayer. But to understand the word tempt is probably is important here because it means two things in, in the Greek. One is it means to prove what's there. The idea mean, to reveal what's really there. And so the temptation of Christ from God's standpoint was to prove that Jesus was sinless and worthy to be the perfect lamb. That was the whole point. I mean, God already knew it, but proving it to us, basically. Uh, but the word also means, of course, to tempt. And the idea of tempting um, usually means being tempted to do something that's wrong or bad or evil, right? And so th this whole thing here, from God's perspective, the temptations of Jesus were to prove to us his worthiness to be our perfect sacrifice. From Satan's perspective, it was an attempt to tempt him into sin, right? To divert him from his purpose. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, um, it was, Satan temporarily has authority over the world. You see in the, in the last temptation of Christ there in verse 8 in Matthew 4, again the devil took him to the very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So obviously Satan had the ability to give Jesus those kingdoms. They were his kingdoms to give to Jesus. How do we know that? Jesus didn't say, they're not yours to give to me. What do you mean? Jesus said, no, I'm not going to be tempted to, to divert away from my purpose. Instead, I'm going to walk the path that God has before me. So um, the kingdoms of this, of this world are, are, are Jesus, not, not Jesus as all they will be at some point in time when he comes back. The kingdoms of this world belong to Satan. And that means the kingdom of Iran, the kingdom of Afghanistan. America, Canada, Western, I mean, it's, it's, they all belong to him. There are lesser and greater degrees of evil within each one of those kingdoms, but they're all his to give. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this particular world. Um, in relation to God, um, Satan's activities include, uh, he's tried to set up an alternative program to God's program, right? That's, that's, he, he, uh, <clears throat> um, in Second Corinthians 11, verse 15, um, Therefore, it's not surprising if, if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Talking about Satan's servants, he disguises himself as servants of righteousness. So, in relationship to God, his activities are to, to set up an alternative way of life within this universe and try to convince the people who populate this earth that this is the right way to live. And kind of we fall for it, don't we? I mean, think about the amount of attention that we devote to political things as opposed to God's kingdom things. 
And there's a certain expectation that we have that in America, our government can conquer our problems and meet our needs without God being a part of it. Right? That's why we have legislation. We have Democrats and Republicans and tax breaks and more taxes and social programs and, you know, all that stuff is their ideas that, that uh, percolate up and there are some person's view of what the best way of life is to live within this kingdom we call the United States, right? And, but how often is God really a part of that? And the reality is the world won't function, can't function, won't be what it's supposed to be except by God being a part of everything that happens. And that can't happen in a world where most people don't believe in God, right? But still, people place their faith. I'm one of them. I place my faith in one of Satan's kingdoms to take care of me and give me the best life possible, right? We all do. And that's, that's, that's kind of a, an, an abrupt reality that I, I kind of need to, to rethink a little bit here. Um, and in 2 Timothy 3.5, uh, there's, there's a reference to um, where, where Paul is warning um, uh, Timothy, in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pro- pleasure rather than lovers of God, kind of describes our modern world, and it describes the ancient world too for that matter, it does, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. So there's this idea that that, that uh, there's a form of godliness that people should recognize and try to adhere to, but they do so with, without actually recognizing the power of godliness in us. Live a life that makes sense, that does good, without God being a part of it. That's kind of Satan's deception. Please, Wayne was talking about all the youth get, get duped into following one or the other, and we can't tell the difference of that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and in in uh, First Timothy. Uh, Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we see one way that this uh, 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 false kingdom program is manifested. Uh, But the Spirit explicitly says that in the later days some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own consciousness as with a branding iron. That's pretty tough stuff. What's that look like? Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. So that that kind of legalism, although it doesn't seem like it's a bad thing, you know, to to to, to be super righteous. That that super righteousness and legalism is actually um, uh, it's a false asceticism, if you will, that Satan is trying to cause people to create in culture without the Holy Spirit being the means of transformation to bring about righteous behavior. So legalism in all of its manifestations is exactly that. And you might say, well, where do I see legalism today? Well, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, right? There's a bunch of rules and regulations that people have to abide by. Women can't drive. Actually, they can drive now. But, I mean, a bunch of very strict rules that people are supposed to live by there. And they think that these rules are things that give them standing before God. And if they will... Do the do's and don't do the don'ts that Allah will look favorably on them. They've been deceived. Uh, another, The opposite way that this uh, 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 false kingdom program manifests itself is you, you see it in Revelation chapter 2, um, verses, verse 24, where uh, uh, back in verse 20, there's a reference to um, – this is the church at Thyatira, excuse me um, – um, where verse 20, I have this against you, talking about the church. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they become – commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And then in verse 24, uh, it says, By say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, place no other burden on you. So um, – there were some people in the Thyatira church who didn't know the deep things of Satan. Well, what are those deep things? Committing acts of immorality and eating things sacrificed to idols. So this idea that we can eat and drink. I mean, in America, that's kind of a, an immorality that's kind of manifested itself in our culture. Not just in Western Europe for that matter too, isn't it? Uh, so, that, and Of course, ancient Rome and ancient Greece were that way as well, where the purpose of life was to 
eat, drink, and be merry, right? Except for now, I guess it's changed a little bit in that and when it says eat, drink, and be merry, it's talking about men who want to be merry, M-A-R-Y, not M-E-R-Y. This is, sorry, that's a joke. <laughs> well, think about it, though. I mean, in some ways, I mean, the, the idea that, that uh, you know, gender dys- dysmorphia and stuff like that, I mean, it comes from somewhere. And, and whether it's biological or spiritual or a combination of the two, it, it's, it's not exactly the way that God created life to be lived. It's not the best way. It's not his best way for, for, for life to be lived. Anyway, so that's, that's Satan's activities in relation to God. In relation to the nations, we know from Revelation 20, verse 3, that, that um, he's uh, a, a uh, deceiver of the nations. And he threw him, meaning Satan, into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. So Satan's business has been um, um, to be a deceiver of the nations. Have a good day. Um, And there are some obscure passages in in the Old Testament that kind of give us a little glimpse of what this might look like. Like the, the... the curtain that separates the spiritual world from the physical world is peeled back a little bit. And in Daniel chapter 10, there's a reference to what this looks like. I'm talking about the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me, meaning Gabriel, for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, the archangel, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. The, 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 the prince of the kingdom of Persia is a reference to an angelic being. And uh, what we seem to see here is that kingdoms of this world have have satanic, demonic influences that influence them in a certain way. And the kingdom of, of the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was, was, was at the time, it, the Medo-Persian Empire was a great empire. But isn't it amazing that you see the same thing going on right now in Iran? I mean, Iran is Persia. They're still, the, the prince of Persia is still active there today. And Iran's deceived about the real God, the true God, what's best for its people. I'm very deceived. You know, if, if Iran would simply put down its nuclear weapons capabilities and 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 kind of rejoin the world, it would, it would do just fine, wouldn't it? But instead, they have this idea that their mission is to become a nuclear power so they can destroy Israel. There's that level of hatred in them that that, that they've been deceived about what's really best for them and their people. And you can pick other other countries as well, for that matter. Um, in, in 1 Thessalonians 2:18, um, Paul says, "I wanted to come to you." More than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Well, how did Satan hinder Paul from going back to Thessalonica? And the answer is uh, Paul was kicked out of Thessalonica after about a month of ministry because there was some, some riots and stuff like that. And there was a, apparently a governmental ban that kept him from going back. So in that particular case, uh, Satan hindered Paul from going back to Thessalonica to minister to the Thessalonians by uh, influencing the government and, and the city of Thessalonica to to um, keep Paul from coming back. You can't come back to our city. And of course, from the Thessalonians' point of view, it's last time you're here, you caused a riot. So you shouldn't come back. We don't want any riots. But from from a God's point of view, Satan was influencing the, the government authorities in Thessalonica to keep the gospel from being propagated in Thessalonica. So uh, it, it looks like that. Um, ultimately, we know from... Revelation chapter 13, verses 2 through 4, that at some point in the future, every nation on earth will recognize Satan and worship him. And the, be- and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads that had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon. So at some point in time, all of the nations will overtly... They'll, they'll drop the facade of, of, of being deceived directly, and they'll, they'll worship Satan himself. Um, so um, that's, that's Satan's activities or his, 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 what he does in relationship to the nations. In relationship to unbelievers, uh, we see in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that he blinds the minds of the unbelievers. Talking about uh, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So if you have somebody in your life that just is blind to the gospel, you know why. Satan and his demons are doing their best to blind their mind to understand what's really, what's, what's, what the gospel is really all about. Um, and uh, in, in the parable of the soils in Luke chapter 8, um, uh, verses 
8 through 12, uh, talking about the seed. Remember, remember the, the seeds that are scattered, some on good ground, some on thorns and thistles, some by the road. With respect to the, the, the seeds that are scattered by the road, uh, uh, Jesus says this. For those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away from the word of their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. So Satan's activities towards unbelievers include blinding their minds and taking away the gospel from them so that they won't believe and be saved. Again, so if you, if you have a friend who doesn't recognize the gospel and refuses to see it, it's because the activities of Satan and his demons are, are keeping them from seeing the truth behind the gospel. It's just that simple. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, so that, that's, that's his ministry towards unbelievers, not ministry, his activities. His activities towards believers, that's us, right, okay? Um, uh, the tempter, that's a biggie, right? Um, <clears throat> Uh, so Satan is the tempter. We know that already. Um, but what does he tempt us in doing? Remember, from God's perspective, temptation is to prove what's really there. And really the word temptation doesn't imply that it changes what's, what, what's within you. The word means act, outside pressures and things simply reveal what's already there. Okay? So for a, a man who's tempted to look at bad things on the Internet, and he ultimately does... It's not the bad things on the Internet that's really drawing him to it. Instead, um, what's going on is there's something inside that man that pulls him to it. Make sense? And the, the, the term was actually – it's a metallurgical term that was used to, to measure the purity of metals. And so that, that's what temptation is. Like, like I measure a piece, of, a, a, gold, a piece of gold to figure out how pure it is, and the, and the test reveals that you're 14 karat, 22 karat, 24 karat, whatever. And circumstances and pressures and life, life events – um, reveal what's really within me, whether it's good or bad, how I respond to it. So as the tempter, that's what Satan wants to do. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that I think that, 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 that or, there are probably at least three areas where Satan tempts unbelievers. Um, <clears throat> back to our story about the Thessalonians, um, you know, Paul wanted to go back to Thessalonica, but he was hindered by Satan from doing so. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, Paul says this, For this reason, when I could endure it, no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and your labor would be in vain. Well, what temptation would the Thessalonians have been subject to at that point in time? Imagine all the stuff that was around them in the culture. Exactly. All the false worships or whatever they, what was going on in their world at that time. Yeah, exactly. They're being tempted to forego the simplicity of the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, instead to go back to letting themselves be conformed to whatever Greek society would want to make them. That's how all these churches were. They mm-hmm. were all smack dab in the middle of some awful place. Yeah. Um, we have also an example, uh, in, again, in Ananias and Sapphira. There, you know, Satan tempted them to cover up their 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 lie and, and to cover up their selfishness. And, and um, So that's an example of, of what the temptation would be. And But maybe the primary temptation that Satan exerts on believers is found in 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Again, stop depriving one another. It's talking about sexual behavior between a husband and wife. Accept by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again. So Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And certainly in our, our sex-crazed world, I mean, that's a huge temptation for, for so many people. I mean, you read the studies, uh, not only are, are men watching pornography, but women are too, which is kind of a, a remarkable thing. I mean, I, I, it's just... We're just a, a sex-obsessed world. Um, in, in our Sunday school class, oh, probably been about a month ago, Anna Maria was talking about that, and he was, she was just talking about the need for the people she counsels to, to exercise a little bit of sexual self-control. So, so Satan, Satan certainly tempts us um, in that area as well. Besides being a tempter, Satan is also our adversary. And by that, um, he opposes us uh, in, the, in our... In, uh, our witness of the gospel and the things that we would do for God. Um, and an example you see of this is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. It's Jesus explaining the parable of the wheat and the tares. Remember the wheat and the tares? The, the tares are the weeds that, that for a, look just like wheat. Uh, you can't really tell until they get already, already full grown that, that you have wheat among, or tares among wheat. Um, 
And when Jesus explains the parable, he says this, And the field is the world, and as for the good seed, those are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So, as an adversary, Satan sows false, false things in our midst to try to deceive us, mislead us, impede the work of the gospel. Well, what does that look like? Well, um, any Christian denomination or cult that speaks the words of Jesus but doesn't actually live out Jesus' life and doesn't have Jesus' life in them would be a terror. Well, what would a terror look like? Um, you know, Jim Jones. When Jim Jones first began his ministry in San Francisco, he was widely hailed as a great man, a great man of God. You want talk about Jim Jones? Jonestown? You probably don't, Jennifer. He, he was a man who established a, a church in San Francisco in the late 60s and early 70s. And they, they did great work with, you know, with, with drug addicts and with, with homeless people. And just, oh gosh, you know, that just looks so wonderful. But at some point in time, it devolved into sexual sin. And the, they all moved off to Guyana, Jonestown, Guyana, and had a cult in Guyana. And in November the 20th of 1978, I remember that because my birthday. Um, that's how I remember it. Um, they all drank cyanide, cyanide laced Kool Aid, and, and 750 people died. So, as our adversary, you know, that, that would be a, a tear planted amongst the wheat. Originally, early on in their ministry, that church looked like a great church. But as it grew, it became evident that it wasn't. And, and you could say that probably you know, the cause of Christ was definitely set back by, by uh, that behavior because. People who weren't Christians, once they saw what Jonestown ultimately became, oh, this Christianity is no good. This is what it's really all about. And you can the Westboro Baptist Church would be, I think, a terror. You know what the Westboro Baptist Church is? They're in Kansas. They're they're the guys who who, who uh, the church members that protest at at uh, military bases when dead American servicemen come back from the Middle East. And they claim that the, the death of that serviceman is God's judgment on America for homosexuality. They call themselves a Baptist church. And they probably sing about Jesus somewhere during their services. But the way they behave clearly means, to me it clearly shows that that church is, is deceived. And, and a, lot of the, a lot of things about Jesus that are attributed to that Westboro Baptist church are not true. But, but non-believers think that this is what God is really like because of the way these people behave. So that would be a weed among the terror. Um, uh, also, one of the things that, that uh, uh, where Satan's our adversary is in, uh, he's, he spotlights our sins. And you remember, he's, he's, he's the one who's called the accuser. In <coughs> Revelation 12:10. Um, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. You see it also, and we've already talked about this a little bit, in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 11. Um, uh, uh, where, where Satan is standing before the angel of the Lord accusing Joshua the high priest. And so what's the accusation? The accusation is that you're a sinner. You're wrong. You're worthless. You're no good. And of course, if we don't fully appreciate and grasp the grace of Jesus and the life of God in us, that can be a, a debilitating thing. Thinking that you're horrible, trash, and whatever, right? I mean, it, it makes you uh, feel guilty and shamed. I don't think God ever wants us to feel guilty of our sin. He wants us to be truthful about it. But our sins have been paid for, so we, we're not guilty of it. He didn't want us to feel shame. I don't think either. Should we feel remorse? Absolutely. But Shame? No. Why? You're a child of God. You're, you are God's. There's nothing shameful about that. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely we do. do. Should we own our mistakes? Absolutely we should. You know, celebrate recovery. Confess your sins to one another. That's the whole point. Because when you own your sin, but also embrace the, the grace of God and the life you get, um, the, the accusation has no power over you, does it? The, the accusation only has power over you as long as you hide it. Once you acknowledge it and confess it, Fellowship's restored, and the accuser, he can accuse all he wants to because you're covered by the blood of Christ. But that's one of the things he does. Um, um, a, uh, another... Uh, uh, Terry, about that, uh, when you confess it, 
that it's gone, but Satan makes it so easy for you to stay under the temptation that he's put before you. Mm -hmm. I testify to that. Absolutely. But when you confess it all and come before the Lord, he forgives it and cleanses you as if you had never done it. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. I think you're exactly right. Other people may not believe that, but I've experienced it, and that's the truth. Satan is a, as subtle as he can be. Makes ever makes doing things that you know you're not supposed to do, but seem to be so good for you that you do it. If that makes sense. It does. Mm -hmm. Good for you, not anybody else, but good for you. Mm -hmm. When you should think be thinking of others. Yeah. I think he tries to convince you that no, you can't can't really be forgiven. I mean, my goodness, look what you did. God can't forgive that. Mm -hmm. He tries to convince you that you're not um, forgivable. Yeah. Forgivable. Exactly. I've heard the story many times. I have, a, I have a friend. Some of you may know him. Uh, he got a girl pregnant when he was 18 years old and convinced her to have an abortion. He's my age now. He's 62 years old, and he just can't forgive himself for it. And so, consequently, he's, his spiritual growth is going to hit a he bumps up against the glass ceiling. He'll, he'll never he'll never keep going up until he gets rid of that glass ceiling. That's his, his that the idea that he can't be forgiven for what he did. I mean, and what he did was wrong. I mean, and and uh, it took a human life. I get that, but God can forgive that too. God can forgive that too. I struggled with it in the beginning of my sobriety. I just because of my lack of faith in Christ, I just couldn't believe that I could be forgiven for, for what I had done. And, uh, and it, it, it was just a struggle for quite a while. Again, just my lack of faith. You know, in Ephesians 4, uh, verses 26 and 27, uh, Paul gives us good advice. Be angry, and yet do not sin. And don't let the sun go down in your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. I mean, think about that for a second. Who would ever want to give the devil the opportunity to hurt you? Yeah, right here, Satan, pop me one. I mean, no, we would never do that. And yet, when we don't forgive people, for example... That's exactly what you're doing. That's exactly what you're doing. It's a it's a scary thing. Um, so anyway, back to uh, uh, there's also a couple other examples of of how Satan acts as an adversary in the New Testament. Sometimes he opposes believers by trying to bring too much pressure on the, the believers so they might might not be able to bear it. And there are two examples in the New Testament of what that looks like. One is the man in First Corinthians five who had an incestuous relationship with his mother. Um, and uh, the discipline, uh, Paul told the Corinthian church, discipline that man, right? And the Corinthian church did. And then later on in 2 Corinthians, he had to tell them to stop disciplining them because, because their discipline of the man had become so intense that the man was in a position where he couldn't bear up under their discipline. And so Paul had to say, okay, don't stop now, forgive him, and, and readmit him, he did the right thing. So sometimes... Life circumstances and things can can create a pressure on us that might almost seem too much to bear, and it could be a million things. You know, poverty, uh, addictions, uh, rejection. In, in India, for example, of course, it's not really a Christian environment, but the lepers in India, there's such a pressure on those poor lepers that life is almost unbearable for them. Um, so that, that's a, a way that the adversary. Um, um, brings pressure on us. But you also see it in, in talking again about the, the young widows. In 1 Timothy 5, 14 and 15, Paul advises Timothy that, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. In that culture, widows were completely defenseless. They had no standing to do anything, no, no husband to earn money for them to live. And so they were a very, very, very... Um, very vulnerable, I'll use that word. And so Paul's advice is let them remarry. Otherwise, something bad is going to happen. They're going to turn aside to follow Satan. Well, what would that look like? Going to prostitution to make a living? I mean, that would be a way to look like, right? And from the woman's standpoint, I have no food. I have no money. I have children. I have no way to feed my children. I have a body. Okay, well, I can use my body to survive. And And so Paul's advice is... The pressures of life are too much on these young people. Remarry and let your godly husband take care of you. So, 
which I think is you know, it's good advice, of course. Um, um, I think there are times when, uh, as our adversary, uh, Satan wants to uh, squelch our testimony, right? And in doing that, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, uh, Peter refers to Satan as a roaring lion. It says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Um, and there are a million different ways that uh, – and actually, actually the, the word devour there is the same word that's used in Hebrews 11.29 to describe what happened to the Egyptians when the Red Sea came crashing down on them um, when, during the crossing of the Red Sea. So that's the idea is that, is that Satan wants to drown our testimony and make it useless, and that can happen a lot of different ways. It can happen because we commit some sin on, that, that embarrasses the church or ourselves or our families. I mean, that, that's, it happens. It shouldn't, but it does. But Satan is always there trying to get you to trip up so that when your sin becomes known, um, it brings dishonor on the church, family, and people want to turn away from, from God because of you. I trusted that man. I followed that man. I did this for that man. And look what he did. I mean, you see that. And I've, I've read a couple of articles in the last month or so where um, – uh, prominent Christians have kind of wa- talked about walking away from God. Maybe you read some of those articles too. You can go on, on ChristianPost.com and search for them. But people who lead churches are now saying, uh, I don't think it's true. After, after all this time of serving and following Jesus, I don't think it's true anymore. And so you know, just the immense damage that that kind of behavior has on a person's testimony, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Um, anyway, so the last topic we're going to talk about is Satan's world. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and this is this is the practical part of where understanding who Satan is, what he controls, what his influences are, how it how it affects us. Um, <clears throat> we've already seen um, that uh, in Second Corinthians four four, um, Satan is called the god of this age. Um, uh, it says in, the, in, in whose case the god of this world, referring to Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Right. So God is the God of this age, and also uh, Jesus refers to him in, in John twelve thirty one as the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. And the, the word for world there is cosmos, and you probably heard that word many times, right? Um, the word cosmos is used 185 times in the New Testament, 105 times John uses the word. It's, it's a common word. Um, and the word itself, cosmos, what it really means, the root word, is, it, means, it means order. As opposed to chaos, and our word cosmetic comes from from cosmos, right? Order, you adorn. In First Peter three three, when Peter's talking about women, he says your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but it also needs to be internal. The word for adornment is cosmos. So your your ordering of yourself, the way you present yourself, the way the way you look. So the the, the cosmos is is an ordered place. It's 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 a world, uh, heaven and earth, I guess both, um, that, that 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 has an order to it. And definitely, our world has an order to it, doesn't it? I mean, it does. There, there's an organization to it. Um, so, so besides referring to the universe itself, sometimes the inhabited earth is referred to as the cosmos, like in Romans 1:8. I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole cosmos. He's referring just to the the inhabited world there. And sometimes the word cosmos refers to the people who live on the earth. For God so loved the cosmos, right, exactly, the world, that he gave his only begotten son in John 3.16. Um, <clears throat> so um, so the, the, the cosmos is an orderly system that functions apart from God. Ultimately, God has control over the cosmos, but for reasons of his own, he's chosen not to completely exercise the control he has right now. Um, um, so, um, Satan and the cosmos, or Satan and the world. Um, first of all, he, Satan has authority over the cosmos. John twelve thirty one. Judgments upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. It hasn't happened yet, but it, it will happen. The ruler of this world, he's referred to. 1611, John 1611, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Again, a, a reference to Satan. Satan. Um, and when, when Jesus was offered all the kingdoms of this world in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, if he would simply bow down and worship Satan, J- Jesus didn't say, um, no, Satan, those aren't your kingdoms to give. I mean, J- Jesus acknowledged, at least implicitly, 
that what Satan was offering, Satan had the power to give. That he owned it. How could he tempt him if he didn't have it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and maybe most explicitly in 1 John 5, 19, um, John says, We know that we are of God <clears throat> and that the whole world, cosmos, lies in the power of the evil one. Which is kind of a startling thought. I mean, it really, it really is. I mean, that that I, I just don't think of. What verse is that? First John five nineteen. And we we've already seen that the Satan's plan for the cosmos is to create a system that rivals God's kingdom that leaves God out of that kingdom. Right. That that's that's what he's that's Satan's uh, uh, dream to promote to promote a counterfeit uh, parallel um, kingdom. That's not based upon God. Like we saw earlier, he, he wants to be like the Most High. I mean, he wants, he that's, wants that position. He can't be the Most High. He just wants to be like him. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you can see where this this rivalry between God's kingdom and, and Satan's kingdoms, well, they surface. Um, in James 1.27, um, James says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep one unstained by the world, the cosmos, right? So James draws a distinction between between uh, what the world will do to you, it will stain you, if you will, and what real pure and undefiled religion looks like. It looks like helping people in need. That's that's one of the things it looks like. Um, and in James 4.4, 4, uh, James says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wants to make himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Again, two parallel kingdoms, right? And there's tremendous temptation to live in the wrong kingdom. And probably to, to a degree, I mean, I, I confess, I probably do from time to time. I, I, I take, I have a job, I need money, I, I worry about our country and politics and elections. And I mean, all that stuff preoccupies me. And it's important, I guess, on some level. But I seem to make sure that I don't let that stuff stain me, if you will. I don't want to need to become a, too much of a citizen of, of, of that particular um, world. Um, and famously, in, in 1 John um, 1 John 2.16, John kind of tells us more of what this worldly system looks like. It says, For all that's in the world, the cosmos, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So you can sort of break down and categorize um, Satan's kingdoms and his 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 order as as being consisting of the lust of the flesh, you know, things that bring us pleasure, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. It can be it can be even not even immoral things. You know, I, I like snow skiing. I do. I love snow skiing. And but once I once I it becomes a lust for me and I begin to exclude other things from my life and focus solely on snow skiing. Um, that's I made a mistake. I've let myself become dominated by the world. That's the lust of the eyes. Uh, the uh, uh, what's the lust of the eyes? I guess what would that be? You think lust of the eyes? I want what I want, right? I want I want a bigger house, nicer car. I want a vacation home in Colorado. I mean, those kinds of things. I want that. I want that. I want that. He has it. She has it. I want it. Again, that 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 kind of thinking is 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 a lust of the eyes, and it and it is a trait of what the world. It's actually like it's not from God; it's from the world, and the boastful pride of life. That's a biggie, isn't it? I'm, I'm this lawyer. I'm that person. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm the best at what I do. I'm LeBron James, or I mean, ha- having this 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 idea that what I do and how I do it is superior and makes me superior to other people. The, the boastful pride of life. That that's a trait of the Satan's world order. It's not from God. So you can break down the world into those categories. There may be some other categories too besides those, but you could probably put most of the of the characteristics of, of, of the cosmos in one of those three, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the most pride of life. Um, so um, I think another thing that, that Satan tries to do is he tries to get us to focus um, our attention on the present rather than eternity. And if you think about it, you know, the average lifespan of an American male or female is what now? 81, two years old, something like that. And so much of our life is preoccupied with 81 years, right? We work hard, try to stay healthy, exercise, save for retirement so we can have a comfortable retirement. We spend a lot of time and effort focused on those things. But it's all about the here and now. When 
how, how, what's, what's, what's the ratio of, of the human life in America to eternity? 82 years over eternity, infinity? I mean, it's, 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 it's the smallest decimal you can, you, can, you, can even, you can even think of. But I think one of the things that Satan does is he makes us preoccupied with the here and now and less um, focused on the hereafter. In 1 John um, 2.17, John says, The world, the cosmos, is passing away. That's good. That's good to know, right? And also it's lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. So, um, uh, Terry. Yes, sir. This is a kind of a funny joke, but uh, sometimes people think it's funny. But the truth, uh, people talking about living past your expected time. Uh huh. And you keep your body good. You eat right. You drink right. And you sleep right and you do everything right and the only thing that gets you is to spend about three or four more years in the rest home paying about four thousand dollars a month there you go and so it's you... better to be with the lord than in the rest home it is I and i think sometimes and while we, while we intellectually acknowledge that sometimes we act like we don't believe it yeah. Hallelujah. That's true. Um, God's relationship to the cosmos. Um, uh, In Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, um, there's a prophecy. uh, It says, You continued looking until a stone was cut out with. This is where Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and and the stone struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. So there's this big old statue that's. The Greek, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and a stone, an uncut stone, destroys all of it. Who's the uncut stone? Jesus, right? Yeah, I, th- I think it's pretty clear that, he, that that's, Jesus is. The uncut stone um, it goes on in Daniel 2.44 where Daniel talks about, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, meaning Jesus' kingdom. And that kingdom will not be left for other people. It will crush and put an end to all those kingdoms. But it will itself endure forever. Um, the point about this is God plans to destroy the cosmos. <laughs> the, the uncut stone Jesus will destroy this order that exists apart from God. And, and, and it'll, it'll uh, all burn up and go away at some point in time. And in Revelation chapter 17 verses 19 at the second coming of Christ, <clears throat> you, you see that, that that's what happens. Um, is, is God plans to destroy the cosmos. Uh, then you have uh, the relationship between the Christian and the cosmos. And this is this is the this is the maybe the the applicable part for us to really give some consideration. We've already seen the James chapter one verse twenty seven verse where James tells us that pure religion is to keep oneself unstained by the world. So we live in a world where we're susceptible to being stained or painted, if you will, by the world. But our object and our purpose should be to live a life that as best we can keeps us unstained by the world and when we are stained by the world we confess it and let jesus clean it off us and go back to trying to becoming unstained by the world so we we have to live in it and we just just don't need to be influenced and painted by it if you will um so our, our our separation from the cosmos ought to mean that we ought to live like like christ the same word that's used for unstained in james chapter 1 verse 27 refers to Christ in 1 Peter 1.19, um, where Peter says, talk about the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, unstained, same Greek word, that's Christ. So the idea of being unstained from the cosmos means we live a Christ-like life, because that's, that's, that's what he did. Um, uh, and and I'll, I'll quote maybe perhaps a, a, a purpose statement that I hear my friend Duane pray quite often. And the Lord who sent me is this, he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing in his sight, right? I hear Duane pray that in elders meetings all the time, that we would do the things that are pleasing in God's sight. So we we live in the world, but we're separated from it. Um, and uh, there are a couple of verses in the New Testament that even give us some examples of, of, of maybe what that relationship looks like. In uh, 1 Corinthians... Um, Paul talks about uh, 
verse first Corinthians five nine, he says, I wrote to you in my letter. What letter is that? It's Paul's letter to the Corinthians that we don't have. <laughs> but Paul had written a letter uh, not to associate with immoral people. And apparently the Corinthians misunderstood what that meant because Paul has to go back and clarify what he meant by that. I did not mean at all – I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or with idolaters for then you would have to go out of the world. <laughs> um, Actually, I wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother who, if he's an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reveler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with one. So the, Paul's point is that that um, <clears throat> you have to live in the world. If you if you completely separate yourself from unsaved people, then you, the only place to go is to go out of the world, which means you're died and gone to heaven, right? So so we're situated in the world, um, and we have to live in the world. We, we can't. We can't separate ourselves completely from it without without committing suicide, I guess. Um, uh, in 1 Corinthians 7.31, Paul gives the advice uh, – or let's go back to 7.30, actually, 30, 29 through, through 31. I, I, I say this, brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they ever had none, those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess. That's a hard way of saying it. And to those who use the world as though they did not make full use of the world. Um, what Paul is referring to here is what – he's, what he's saying is um, he's talking about marriage and singleness and weeping and rejoicing and having and not having things. It, the idea is don't abuse or overuse them, but you can make use of them. I, I can make use of a marriage. It's, it's a good thing. I can make use of the things that God has given me in life, cars and you know the ability to make a living. But don't overuse it or, or, or abuse it, if you will. Don't become preoccupied with the things of this world. So the, the, the morally neutral things that exist in the cosmos are all things that we can participate in. It's okay to be an American citizen. It's okay to vote. It's okay to, to make a living, drive a car, live in a house. All those things are, are good. Where they become dangerous is where they become idols in and of themselves that draw our attention to them and pull us away from the things that God would have us do. And then we become stained by the world. And I would argue, and you all might, you're free to disagree, but the American preoccupation with politics right now is such that we're abusing and overusing the system. You know, right now, American evangelical leaders quite often weigh in on 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 Trump issues and things like that. Uh, and also, I guess the other side, some people – so there, there's a Christian organization I saw this morning that's that's a, a group of evangelicals who are against Trump. I would argue that both of those approaches to life are overusing the political system we live in, which isn't either evil or not evil. But it's it's taking away from the centrality of the message of the gospel of Christ that God wants to save people because he loves them. The, you, 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 can, you can agree or disagree, but I, I think the – the message of the gospel is being obscured by our use of our political rights to free speech and stuff like that. Um, and also, there's also... Because he's going to destroy this world anyhow, so he doesn't care about it. Correct. Really. And, and even money. Um, you know, in First Timothy 6, 17, Paul says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on, this, on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. So having money isn't a bad thing. Um, instead, just don't become preoccupied with it. Don't become conceited by it. Don't fix your hope on the riches that you have. Instead, if you have money, then that's a great thing. And uh, using it in a way that's responsible is a, is a good idea. Um, um, in 1 John 2.15, John gives us good advice. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So, at those moments where you find yourself in love with the world around you, um, guess what? God's love is not bubbling out of you because you're in love with the world. Um, so, um, I guess the last thing about the world is, is to, for us to remember is that um, we have the ability to live a victorious life even though we live in the kingdom of our adversary. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, John says this, and it's something we should all remember. 
So, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but the, he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So, John's advice is just, is just crystal clear. Um, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So, the, the word born there is a perfect tense verb. It's something that happened in the past, but the effects are still being felt today. So we are born of God. We became born again at some point in the past, but that new life we received is still with us up to this moment. Uh, and we can overcome the world by virtue of that life. Um, and it's a faith-driven approach to it. This is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. Um, anyway, so I, I guess the point is that... that um, so how do we live in this cosmos? We're separated from it, although we try to keep ourselves unstained by it. Although they're situated in it, we don't become preoccupied with it. It doesn't become uh, the fixation of our hope. Um, and then finally, we understand and believe that God gives us the ability uh, to overcome the world we live in. And that's a faith-driven approach to life that, that enables us to live a life that looks like Jesus in a kingdom that's... Not his. Which I think would this would back backtrack to our lesson of the Holy Spirit. That's, I think that's part of the reason why we need the Holy Spirit so bad because we, we cannot fight this on our own. Yeah, there's a there's a great yeah, there's a there's a, a a great word study you could do. Uh, look up the word renew in in the New Testament, and it, Paul uses it I think six or seven times, and I could find it if you if you have a second, I'll I'll, I'll just find it for you. Let me search for it. Uh, where was my search? This is a great computer program. I mean, I just, it's a pretty cool thing. I can search the word renew. Every place it comes up in the Bible. I'm not focused on the New Testament, though. Um, okay. The word renew in the New American Standard is used a couple times in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, here, here's, here's where it is. Do not be, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? Um, it's a passive verb. So, something external to us renews our mind. And it's, it's a present participle, so it's the idea of renewing. It's an ongoing process. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Do not lose heart. But though the outer man is decaying, and I can testify that he is, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Our minds need to be refreshed every day. Ephesians 4.23, Paul prays that they'll be renewed in the spirit of your mind, right? Colossians 3.10, 3.10, put on the new self, that's an active verb, we do that, put on the new self, who is being renewed. Again, it's passive. Something external to us is doing it to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created us. Uh, and then Titus 3, 5, we learn about what the means of this renewing is. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So seven times, I think, here are six times in the New Testament in Paul's letters, um, we're told we're being renewed even being renewed daily. Our minds being made new daily. Which kind of relates to your comment, I think, is that we have to be, every morning, we have to have a new mind, the mind of Christ, because it's so easy for us to... Has Jesus been caught the helper by accident? Mm -hmm. He's there to do that very thing. Exactly. Exactly. So, the reality of Satan, um, what he does, what his names are, the interaction that we have with Satan, and we do, is we live in a world that he controls. And it doesn't feel like that living in America. It really doesn't feel like that. I mean, I kind of want to watch It's a Wonderful Life and think, that, that, that can't be Satan's kingdom. But it is. Um, and one, one of the verses that we, we didn't look at and we should have, and, I, and I'll um, let's see if I can find it real quick because it's important. Um, if I can let me find my notes here real quick. I've got a lot, I, I have too many notes. Uh, Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me see if I can get there. I 
I, I, I talked about it earlier. Did anybody write down the, the reference to that Satan's um, uh, you had mentioned Second Corinthians four four. Okay, let's see. So that's the version of the point. No, that wasn't. Um, but the, the reference is to that Satan actually appears as an angel of light. Let me let me find the reference. Satan doesn't always happen to be. I got an appointment. I got to be somewhere, guys. Hey, thanks, thanks, Matt. Eleven fourteen. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Yes. Um, yeah. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So the, the the dragon, the fierce dragon, doesn't always appear to be mean and nasty and like he's going to kill everybody. Sometimes Satan appears in a way that you think he's a good thing, the angel of light. So. Our, our minds have to be sharp sometimes to recognize him for what he is. So he appears like that all the time because who would blindly walk into a dragon? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there, there are very few people in this world who are so evil that they would cultivate that kind of desire to be in the presence of something so evil. You're be, exactly right. It's got to be, it's got to be uh, appealing enough to want to walk towards. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. And we have to be on the alert because he's prowling all the time. That's a great point too. Yeah, First Peter five, exactly. He's like a, like a roaring lion. So, so anyway, um, that's Satan. Next time we'll cover demons. Um, and uh, any anybody want to say anything else, or if not, we'll be. You know, it's obvious that there's a struggle going on. <laughs> it's obvious, and you know, Christ is in us, and He is against He is against Christ. So this battle is not a. Right. Nope, you're right. It is ongoing. It's there because we have Christ in us. We are obviously against him. That's, that's exactly right. And then in, in the upper room, that's, that's, that's what Jesus tells the disciples. The world hates me. It's going to hate you too. <laughs> anyway, Why couldn't the slave be a 